Okay, thanks everybody for coming this morning and thanks to those who are watching on video. I'll start today's class with a little anecdote about the wine world like we usually do. Uh, we talked about the degree day system when we talked about grape ripening and here's a map of the wine growing regions in France and you can see the various degree day accumulations in the different areas of France. So for example, if you wanted to grow grapes in Champagne or in Burgundy, you'd see that it was less than 2,500 degree days. So it's a cooler area and you might grow Chardonnay or Pinot Noir as they do of course in both Champagne and in Burgundy. So you can think about this and start thinking about the wine regions of the world when you think about where you're going to plant your vineyard and make your wine in the future. Think about the degree day system in these di different growing regions. Okay, so today we're going to talk about fermentation. We're going to do an overview of fermentation quickly and talk about the different winemaker decisions involved in fermentation. So let's start uh, thinking about the decision of when to harvest. We talked about grape ripening and we talked about how acid declines during the growing season, sugar accumulates, we talked about green flavors like the bell pepper flavor uh, declining, that methoxypyrazine declining as the grapes ripen, and we talked about ripe flavors increasing as we get closer to harvest. So there's a sweet spot when all those factors come together and the winemaker makes a decision about when to harvest. Okay. Over here we've got the, the sugar scale, degrees bricks. Over here we've got the acid scale. But what's missing from this chart? That's right, units. Units are missing. So with that in mind, please do this clicker question. Okay, you all did great. You all got, you all chose number five. That's the right answer. So degrees bricks is actually grams of soluble solids in your grape juice divided by 100 grams of total juice. So it's a weight to weight measure, grams to grams. And we're talking about soluble solids and we think about that as representing sugar and as you get close to harvest, the, 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 the percent of soluble solids is very indicative. It's very close to the amount of sugar in your juice. So we use degrees bricks to indicate the sugar, sugar accumulation. So, I've added to our chart then grams of soluble solids per 100 grams of juice. Over here, I added the units, which is grams of acid per 100 mils of juice. So it's a weight to volume measure. And you often hear winemakers quote the acid scale as grams per liter instead of per 100 mils. So it would just be 10 times this scale. So if we had 0.75 grams per 100 mils, like we show on this particular chart, that equates to 7.0 grams per liter. So you'd say, if some winemaker said, I've got 7.5 grams of acid, that means 7.5 grams of acid per liter. Or, like, if, like, like, we, like I saw when I worked in New Zealand, we had sometimes 12 grams of acid per liter, which is about double what you normally want. The grapes that year were very underripe in New Zealand. So, that's the acid scale. So the winemaker makes a decision about this sweet spot and when to harvest. Okay, let's look at some of those numbers. Let's fill in these blanks. So, sugar accumulation. Sparkling wine, we're going to harvest a little before still wine, so sugar accumulation will be lower, and that tends to be in what range? Anybody know? Very good. Yep, yeah, let's go 19. 19 to 22%. How about still wine? Exactly, around 20, 24%. So you could even say 22 to 26. 26 is pretty high, but you, you'll see that sometimes because winemakers are coming to believe, some winemakers, that, um, that that accumulation of extra sugar equates to extra ripeness and better flavors. So We could go with 22 to maybe 26 percent for still wine. What about acid? We won't, we don't want it too low, or we have a very flat wine. So it works out that we like an acid level about above about 0.55. And I've used grams per hundred mil, so it's 0.55 grams per hundred mil. 
and 5.5 grams per liter for acids. You want acid probably above that level. For sugar, I indicated it as percent, um, and I'm using that, in this case, synonymous with degrees bricks. Okay? So flavors, where you want them, green flavors low, ripe flavors high. Many winemakers have other indicators of ripeness. I know one winemaker who looks a lot in red wine production at the tannins. She believes when the tannins go from the front of your mouth to registering more in the back of your mouth, that indicates a change in the tannin profile of the grapes that's indicative of ripeness. So that's one of the things she looks for. So winemakers all have those subjective flavor-based indicators that uh, indicate when they're going to harvest as well. So, very basic winemaking process. There are three things we're going to do. After we harvest the wine, first we're going to crush the grapes. We're going to liberate the juice from the skin, so we'll crush the grapes. We're going to ferment that juice into wine, so that'll be the second bucket. And at some point, we have to separate the skins from the juice. And that'll be when we press off the skins. So our very three very basic buckets are crush, ferment, and press. So if you look at the white wine process at the top, in which order do we do these three operations? That's right. We crush, we press, and then we ferment. Because white wine is not fermented in contact with the skins. So we're going to press the juice off the skins and then do the fermentation. So with white wine, we go one crush, two press, three ferment. All right? So crush, press, ferment. Red wine, same three buckets, we just change the order. We crush, we ferment. We ferment the wine in contact with the skins, and then we press the finished wine off of the skins, right? So those are our three buckets. So for red wines, it's crush, ferment, and then press. Here's where our yeast now get involved. Our yeast is going to take the sugar, and the sugar in grapes uh, the two sugars are primarily glucose and fructose, and they're more or less in a 50-50 ratio, though that'll vary by grape varietal. But uh, they both have the same chemical formula. So looking at the overall chemical reaction of fermentation, we can fill in the chemical formula for glucose or fructose as this, C6H12O6. Then yeast are going to take, for every molecule of sugar, they're going to take that sugar and they're going to make two molecules of CO2 and two molecules of ethanol. And what's the formula for ethanol again? That's right, CH3, CH2OH. And that's our yeast transformation. And we'll get out, the yeast will get out of that some energy, and there'll be a heat, some heat produced as the byproduct of this too. Okay? So that's our basic chemical formula of fermentation. Now, let's talk about one of the most important um, aspects of, of using yeast to, our, to do our fermentation. We talked early in the semester about the four different buckets uh, from which we get wine flavor compounds. We talked about how some of the compounds come from grapes, and those compounds, those chemical, uh, those molecules, those chemical compounds, go right through the wine without any change. There's another bucket of grape compounds, however, number two here, that actually is processed either by the yeast or by malolactic bacteria, if you choose to do malolactic fermentation. We'll talk about that in detail soon. But here today we're talking about yeast fermentation. The yeast will process some of these flavor compounds and make different flavors in your wine. We'll talk about one of those specifically in just a sec. And then the other two buckets we're going to talk about as we, as we move on down the semester 
the flavor compounds imported by storage, especially barrels, and then those reactions that happen during aging. So today we're mostly interested in the second bucket and how yeast actually change our flavors during fermentation. Um, because yeast do that, the choice of yeast is critical. So decision number two is which yeast strain to use. So there are two main species, and then we'll talk about strains. There are two main species. And the first one is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And the second one is Saccharomyces biannis. And we'll often just abbreviate Saccharomyces with an S. But these are two of the main species used in winemaking. Now, the main one is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's the same one that we use in baking, the same one that makes our bread rise, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. What's interesting about yeast is that there are many different strains within each of these species. Last thing to talk about today very quickly is just cap management. And I wanted to show you this. We're going to be out of time, but I wanted to show you this. This is a little fermentation I did in a cylinder. These are just table grapes. I added some yeast. You can see the CO2 bubbling out rapidly. And what that CO2 does, CO2 does is it pushes the grape skins up to the top of the fermentation. And that creates this cap. And, the cap, and so winemakers have to make a decision about how to manage this cap for two reasons. One, you need contact between the skins and the juice. And then you need to keep other microbes, other than uh, microorganisms, other than yeast, from growing on top of the cap. Because we're out of time. Thanks very much for your attention.